Hey everybody, welcome to ARE Live. Um, I'm Mark Tier, the founder of Black Spectacles, and today I'm again I'm with Mike Newman, who um, he's today he's going to talk about uh, the building systems mock exam that we put together. Um, he may also talk about the uh, drone that he just bought, apparently. So hell yeah. <laughs> so I don't know what that's all about, but I guess maybe we'll find out about <laughs> it. Um, the exam that we issued. Uh, and that we're going to talk about today is going to help you. I mean, the idea there is that it, it's designed to help you recognize the different systems and the factors that go into choosing the right one uh, for a project. Um, and it's designed also to help you understand the different components of the systems. Um, so that's sort of the, uh, the goal behind the exam. Um, before we get started, if you'd like to attend our next ARE live broadcast, uh, well, we're going to um, uh, open the mic again to Mike Newman, and he'll be able to, or he'll have the opportunity to answer any of the questions that you guys may have about the ARE. It'll be a little bit of an open session. Um, you'll be able to do that uh, if you go to blackspectacles.com slash podcast to register for Q&A with Mike. Um, and during that broadcast, you'll have a chance to ask questions to the group and comment on the, the different topics that, uh, that the community sort of brings to that session. Now, if you don't know Mike, he's an adjunct professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He's also the founder of Shed Studio, and he is the instructor for Black Spectacles Online AIA ARE Prep Curriculum, which if you haven't already checked out our AIA ARE Prep Curriculum, you can head over to blackspectacles.com uh, to watch any of the free tutorials from the courses. Every, every one of the courses has, you know, some free videos. Um, and today uh, we have a special Black Spectacles promo code to share at the end. And also for the first time, um, at the end of today's episode, we'll choose someone from all the folks who submitted their answers to the mock exam. Uh, and that person will win a uh, free one month uh, Black Spectacles membership for access to the AIA ARE prep tutorials, as well as our software tutorials. So uh, stay tuned for that at the end as well. So. Uh, first, let's hand it over to Mike. Okay, Mark, thanks. Um, so as Mark mentioned, uh, we're gonna be looking at the uh, Building Systems Mock Exam. And we're gonna use these 10 questions to consider a few different issues that are likely to come up on the exam uh, itself. Now, obviously, who knows exactly how they'll come up or you know, what, what form that will, that will take. Uh, we all know that there are many, many, many different uh, potential topics and questions that, uh, that could be uh, put in front of you, but at least this will give us a sort of starting point, a useful place to start so that we can uh, uh, kind of dive in and thinking about all these different systems and how you can start imagining them and separating them uh, apart from each other as we, uh, as we go along. So, let's get started. Hang on, here we go. All right, there we go, sorry. Hello, right, now we're getting started. Okay, so the first one, uh, first one is a question that's uh, gonna be about like what kind of system is likely to be chosen for a specific kind of scenario. Uh, we're gonna have a couple of those questions along the way here. Uh, and so the first one says, designing a large three-story multi-wing university office structure, you would probably use a, and then the four answers are, central air handling unit, uh, individual fan coil units, uh, central chiller chilled water loop, or uh, D, a DX rooftop unit. So let's uh, look at the question for a second um, and kind of analyze it a little bit. So it's a three-story building, so that's kind of interesting. It's multi-wing, that's also sort of interesting. Uh, the university office building, so that implies, university office building implies long-term ownership. So this is not like a developer going in, putting in a building uh, and, uh, you know, condoizing it or, you know, uh, leasing it up immediately and then, you know, jumping away. Uh, this is somebody who's going to be holding a building, presumably, and we don't, we don't actually know, but uh, just from the little bit of information we have, it's a reasonable guess to say this is somebody who's going to be holding a building for a long time. Uh, and that sort of multi-wing aspect of things, if you imagine a building that, uh, I don't know, in plan looks, uh, how about something goofy like that? All right, so it's like a, say, a Y shape or something. Uh, so if we, if we start imagining three stories, multi-wing, uh, long-term ownership, uh, it starts to, the answer starts coming out to us uh, pretty, pretty readily. So let's just sort of run through them for a moment. Let's say we're talking about a central air handling unit. So that means we'd have on one floor, maybe a basement or something, uh, a, a big air handling unit, and that would be blowing air straight up through the building uh, in great big trunk lines 
uh, and those trunk lines would have to go in all these different directions. Uh, that's going to be an awful lot of uh, duct work. It's going to be great big trunk lines. It's going to take up a huge amount of uh, floor space. And it's not going to be wildly efficient because you're going to be uh, pushing that air all over the building. Uh, so the air handling unit would have to be pretty, pretty massive uh, in, in order to do this. Uh, the, if this was a centralized building, like a square or, or a simple rectangle, then it probably makes a little more sense and it, it could easily be. Um, so central air handling unit seems to me like it's a maybe, uh, but probably not an actual answer. Let's look at B, individual fan coil units. So the fact that uh, it's individual offices, you could imagine a building filled with offices and they have lots of small fan coil units in each of the different ones. Similarly to if it was a building filled with classrooms uh, and you'd have lots of uh, uh, um, these fan coil units in each classroom, uh, kind of spreading through the, the whole building. Um, that seems kind of unlikely, but possible. Um, so I'm going to call that one another maybe. Uh, then we have down to C and D, central chiller, chilled water loop, uh, and a DX rooftop unit. Uh, and the answer in my mind, um, uh, obviously any of these could be the potential answers. It's, you know, it's hard to know for sure, but from the limited information that we have, uh, a DX rooftop unit just seems really unlikely. Uh, rooftop units have a relatively short lifespan uh, because they're up on the roof and they have to deal with uh, all the rain and snow and sleet and UV rays and all that stuff. Uh, and so they're great in situations where, you know, 15 year lifespan is sort of perfect, right? That uh, you're going to put it up on top of a, um, a strip mall or something like that. Uh, that's going to be just fine. And you're going to put it on top of uh, some uh, many other types of places where, that have that kind of fast paced uh, likelihood of a change out. Um, and it has a sort of a low first uh, dollar cost, which is great, but not necessarily uh, a really efficient kind of life cycle cost. With the university, life cycle cost is really going to be uh, a big part of their decision making. So a DX unit just doesn't seem plausible. Uh, so we're kind of left with C, and C is the answer that I'm going to suggest it is. So C is the answer. Let's talk about what a central chiller chilled water loop actually is. So imagine we have uh, a three-story building, and I'm going to simplify it just for our, I'm not going to worry about the wings uh, on this particular version. Uh, so we have a three-story building. I've given it a basement, although obviously it doesn't need to have a basement. And somewhere down in that basement, uh, I'm going to put the chiller in. So the chiller is going to be a device uh, that's one big box that has two barrels on the sides. The chiller is going to be a device uh, where I can, sep I can move heat around. When we talk about cooling, uh, that cooling is done not by creating cool, really. What you're really doing is you're removing heat. And the chiller is the device that's going to do that. So uh, the chiller is going to take heat out of one side, one of the barrels, and it's going to create a sort of coolness in that by removing the heat. Uh, and then from that, there's going to be a cold water pipe that comes out and goes somewhere up the building. And that cold water pipe can then connect to uh, air handling units at each floor, maybe just one per wing. Uh, could be divided maybe one for a kind of uh, auditorium space and the rest for the office spaces. Uh, it, any number of different ways, I can then use that chilled water in the air handling unit so when you get to the air handling unit, you've got you know, some big box. And that box has, uh, I'm going to draw so you can see through the box. Uh, and that box has a great big fan in it. And that fan is blowing air uh, across. And as it's blowing air across, there's a coil. And that coil is going to be filled with either hot or cold water. Uh, and that chilled water loop is going to supply that cold water. We would then also have a boiler down in that basement and connect to that pipe so you can make it a hot pipe if you wanted. We tend to refer to the uh, air conditioning because the air conditioning is a little trickier and so we tend to, when we're talking about these systems, we tend to talk about it from the air conditioning standpoint. Um, but uh, the, the gist of it is I can then place 
these air handling units wherever I need them uh, around the building and not have to send very, very large quantities of air around the building. I can just send little tiny uh, two inch water pipe uh, around the building and get all the cooling I need into all the different uh, locations and then turn it into an air side loop once it gets there by blowing the air across. So that air is going to get blown across the, by the fan, it's going to blow across the coil, uh, it's going to go uh, out the other side and uh, into a trunk line uh, that is uh, part of the ducted uh, system into the supply. Uh, and then eventually there'll be a return system and that return system is going to bring the air right back to that air handling unit and send it off and get it reconditioned. So this simple idea of having um, the chiller in the basement, or it doesn't have to be in the basement, I always think of them in the basement, that's kind of the old school way of doing it, it could be anywhere. Um, but uh, if you kind of think of it as like the, the big device down in the basement, uh, pulling the heat out of the cold water barrel uh, and putting it onto the hot water into the hot water barrel on the other side uh, and then with that cold water that you've just created you're now able to take that cool water anywhere throughout the building you could be doing it in a centralized location on a whole campus and be sending it uh, all around to different buildings even it's so uh, tight and easy especially if you uh, insulate those pipes uh, and then you can create the the air side uh, loops uh, where you're, you're blowing out of those uh, uh, air handling units you know, where, to where the people are uh, and uh, you can do that anywhere. You can have multiple systems. You could still have just one air handling unit, but uh, it allows you to have centralized uh, maintenance. Um, so this one big thing, you have these air handling units all over the building, but the, like I said, they're pretty simple. It's just pretty much a fan and a coil and some humidification issues and a few other things, but they're pretty simple boxes. The big issue is going to be the chiller itself. That's going to be the place that uh, most of the action is happening. And so the maintenance is going to be in that one location. That's where all the refrigerants going to be. Uh, that's going to be the place that's going to uh, be the most uh, um, effort from the maintenance standpoint, from the facilities people. Uh, the boiler would be a similar spot, although it's a probably a little simpler than the chiller. Uh, so all of that can happen in one central spot uh, and you kind of keep all those sort of dirty, difficult, noisy things happening in, in one location. With that chiller in that basement, uh, the way that we've now made the one side cool, the way we've made the, the cool barrel cool, is by removing heat from it and putting that heat into the hot barrel. Uh, so that hot barrel has to get rid of the heat and typically that would be done by having those uh, pipes go up uh, and go to a cooling tower up on the roof and that cooling tower is going to spray that water out. There's a couple different ways it could go but it's going to spray that water out in order to get rid of the heat out to the air. Uh, so as that heat goes out to the air uh, that uh, uh, is, is effectively uh, taking the heat uh, from the chilled water barrel, moving it to the hot water barrel, and then from there moving it up to the roof and then getting it out to the air. So you've taken the heat from one place and you've thrown it to the outside, which is a tricky thing to do. Uh, so all of that is happening uh, through this, um, what we would refer to as a heat rejection loop. So that's that pipe is going up, you're spraying it down, and then you're recollecting that water at the bottom of that uh, cooling tower, bringing it down, bringing it back in order to collect some more heat and then go back up and, and reject the heat more. So uh, these systems are full loops. I send the cool, chilled water uh, up to the air handling units and then when it's done, I bring, bring it back to get cooled again. Uh, and the way that I'm doing that is in that chiller, I've got a refrigerant loop that's going back and forth uh, and moving the heat from one side to another. One of the questions that Laura's asking here, she's saying, isn't there a concern with the water traveling long distances and losing the heat due to the wing design of the building? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, and the answer to that is yes, but less so because it's relatively easy to insulate, um, less so than if it was a big uh, box of air moving along. Uh, if you imagine uh, for a big building like this, the ductwork would be the size of a car. Uh, so you have uh, maybe even a you know, van or something. So you have this big quantity of air and uh, you can insulate it, but it's moving around in kind of a clunky way. It's going to lose a lot of its uh, heat or cooling 
uh, as it goes through that process. Whereas a simple pipe with uh, good insulation not only will be smaller and easier to fit in, uh, easier to get, or you know, uh, architecturally easier to fit in around, um, but with that uh, solid insulation around it, you get uh, a very good um, insulating capacity without it becoming a, a big ordeal. So yeah, it can uh, you can lose heat or cooling, um, but uh, it's actually going to be way easier to insulate that than it would be pretty much anything else. Uh, so in this scenario, uh, we have a number of different things going on. Uh, one of them is we have this one device that is moving the heat from one side to the other and then eventually rejecting that heat out to the cooling tower. Cooling tower doesn't have to be on the roof, it could be in the parking lot, it could be outside uh, back or something. Like, there's a number of different ways to do it. I'm just talking about kind of the classic simple system. Uh, and then we have all these uh, air handling units uh, wherever they, wherever they want to go, using that chilled water to get that uh, around. And it could be heated water if it's the boiler and it's that season. Um, but that overall system for a big university, for a, a sort of ownership, uh, long-term ownership, this is sort of the classic kind of granddaddy of a system, kind of the basic way to go for one of those big, um, you know, big ownership structures. So, okay, let's move on. So number two, uh, number two is essentially the same question, but for a different scenario. So designing a large single story manufacturing building um, for the air supply, uh, you would probably use a, and then pretty much the same answers, central air handling unit, individual fan coil units, central chiller, chilled water loop, DX rooftop units. Um, so all of those same reasons that uh, that we talked about before, uh, this is actually the one where the DX unit on the rooftop is probably gonna make a lot of sense. This is gonna be the one where if I have that great big building uh, and it's a uh, big single story space and I know that I've got uh, you know, various things, oops, <laughs> Uh, various things happening in, in different locations, certain kinds of warehousing, certain kinds of manufacturing, various other things. Uh, this would be a really easy place to just place right up on that roof uh, a big self-contained DX unit. Maybe I have a couple of them, uh, so uh, you could have a different one over the warehouse area than compared to the manufacturing area. You're just going to be blowing in a large volume of air. You're going to be taking in the return at the same spot. It's going to have the refrigerant built into it. It's going to have its heat rejection uh, possibilities built into it. Uh, and in this way, you know, the manufacturing processes change pretty readily. Uh, the idea that you could fairly simply, say 10 years down the road, realize that uh, we're gonna start manufacturing in a slightly different way, let's move it uh, uh, 50 feet over. You could lift it up and move it and change it around. Um, this is a, a very flexible, manipulable system uh, that seems to fit to the single story uh, manufacturing use. Now, with a DX unit, you can certainly add quite a bit of uh, you know, controlling ductwork and all of that to it. Um, but you know, one of the nice things about these rooftop units, you can also just kind of dump in a lot of air. And if I have enough ceiling height, it, uh, it will spread reasonably quickly and easily. So uh, for all the reasons um, that the central chiller and chilled loop water kind of uh, system uh, that we talked about in the previous question, for all the reasons that was a good idea for, for those. For this one, it seems actually kind of in the way. Uh, it's probably just easier and better to have these uh, kind of cheaper, faster things that I can put up on the roof uh, and just kind of get something straight out of it. I have two questions. Yeah. The first one is, um, uh, what does DX stand for? Good question. I was just about to get to that, but all right, good question. So DX, um, a DX system, uh, so what we, what we were looking at in the previous question, I'm gonna, sorry, it's gonna take a second, I'm just gonna go back for a quick second. What we were looking at in the previous question was a chiller, and that chiller had a refrigerant loop, uh, and then it went uh, onto two barrels, and this was all part of the chiller. And it created a cold water loop that went up and gave the chilled water to the air handling units, wherever they were, anywhere around the building. And then the air handling units 
have what's referred to as the air side loop. Not everybody calls them loops. I call them loops because I think it's the clearest way to think of it. Um, and so the air handling loop blows air out into the space after it's been conditioned and then takes air back in through the return. And so it, it's its own loop. The chilled water is its own loop. And then the heat rejection on the other side of the other barrel is its own loop. So this is a four loop system. Got the, ref the refrigerant, it's one. The chilled water is two. The air is three. And the heat rejection oop, <laughs> is four. So I've got four loops. A DX system is one where I don't use the chilled water loop. So I have the other ones. I still have the air side loop. I still have the refrigerant loop. I still have the heat rejection loop in some form. Uh, but I don't need to have the chilled water because I'm not taking the cooling and moving it around the building. I'm just having the, the, that uh, DX unit up on the roof there is going to be a great big box. And it's going to have within it uh, a fan, a coil. And that coil is going to have uh, from uh, a refrigerant loop happening. It's, that refrigerant loop is going to go and feed that coil directly. And then it's going to go back in. So the refrigerant is getting, is getting cooled. Uh, and then uh, by the process of the refrigerant getting cooled, I'm then blowing the fan directly across it. It's blowing the air down into the building. And then I have right above that um, element uh, in, in the same box, I have this device that is, has another fan. It's not always a fan, but I'm, let's just say it's a fan for our purposes here. And it's going to be taking the excess heat that was created and blowing it right out of, the, of uh, that big box. So it has its own very tight, small heat rejection loop. It has its own uh, uh, refrigerant loop, creating the, the coolness on the one side and the hot on the other. And the hot gets rejected out, and the cool gets moved over to the coil. And we then blow the fan right across it and go straight down into the building. So a DX refers to direct exchange um, uh, or direct expansion. Um, typically, direct expansion is the more technical term. Sometimes you'll see direct exchange used. Uh, and it's uh, where you're using the refrigerant itself in the coil uh, for the air handling unit. Second question. Okay, question number three. The hardest part about putting a sink uh, in a kitchen island is, this is a lot simpler of a question. Uh, so there's a couple different possibilities we have here. Scalding risk, air gap, vent, uh, waistline has to reach all the way across the room to the plumbing wall. Uh, the, the idea here is, right, okay, we've got a, we've got a sink, uh, every time we have a sink, uh, we've got a drain, we've got the little faucet coming out. Uh, that drain comes down, there's a uh, trap below the drain. Uh, it then comes down and goes out and eventually out to the uh, sewer in the street all by gravity. Uh, we're not going to worry about the uh, water supply on this one. This is just about the drain. Uh, if this is a, uh, in a wall, if this is a situation where I'm up against a plumbing wall, then it's a fairly simple maneuver. I have to have from that a vent going up to the roof. And that vent goes up through the roof and lets uh, air out and lets air in. And what that does is uh, for whenever I have something else happening uh, in the plumbing system, that say somebody flushes a toilet or uh, there's a, a, you empty a big bucket of water into a sink or something. Uh, what that's going to do is it's going to cause a sort of rush of uh, that wastewater going down that system. And that rush is going to pull and siphon out the water that's in our trap. And so if that siphons out the water that's in our trap, the whole point of having a trap is that when I'm standing here at the sink, washing dishes or brushing my teeth or whatever, uh, I don't have straight from my nose a line going right down there through all of that all the way to the sewer in the street. Obviously, that would smell very bad very fast. 
And so the fact that I have this pipe going up to the roof, this vent pipe, what it's doing is it's allowing air to, uh, instead of siphoning out uh, the water that's in the trap, it's gonna allow air to come shooting down in behind because it's gonna be much easier for this uh, water, as it, this wastewater as it goes down this pipe. Uh, instead of pulling water, which is much heavier, it's just gonna pull air from the roof down. And that's gonna allow these pipes, these uh, 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 traps to not get siphoned out. And that's a huge thing. Otherwise the rooms would smell terrible. It would be a huge problem. But if I'm in a kitchen island, I don't have a wall here, how do I get the vent to go straight up? So what's the hardest part about putting a sink in a kitchen island? So I've got to find some other way to go, uh, to go up because I don't have a place for that pipe to go. And so there's a bunch of very tricky little devices that will do uh, things where they go up and then down below the floor and then over to a wall and then eventually up. Um, and they don't work terribly well, but they work well enough, uh, especially for something like a kitchen sink where that water gets re-filled uh, into that, uh, um, that trap uh, regularly. So uh, the answer is gonna be uh, putting in the vent because that's gonna be the thing. Whenever I have plumbing going down, I have plumbing going up. The waste line goes down, the vent line goes up. Uh, the scalding risk air gap and the waste line, those are all just sort of red herrings in there to uh, test you out. Okay, number four. In a temperate zone, what will typically drive the duct design of the HVAC system? Question, possible answers are cooling system, dehumidification, heating system, sling psychrometer. So first thing we can say is it's not a sling psychrometer. A uh, sling psychrometer is uh, a really kind of fascinating little device. It's worth, uh, it's kind of the old school way of uh, figuring these things out. It's this little device uh, that sits on a little handle um, and you hold the handle and then you swing this thing around uh, above your head and at the end of it it has a little uh, sponge in it and you wet the sponge and uh, after you swing it a few times you the thing itself tests the sponge and it can tell whether you have left uh, moisture behind or whether you've gained moisture into the sponge through that process. And it's a way of understanding the sort of latent heat issues, like how much moisture, what's the actual temperature. Uh, it sort of gives you a much fuller picture of what's the, the air like in that space. Um, there's other ways to do it now, but this, any of the old school folks will still use one of these sling spectrometers. That's not the answer, but it's an interesting thing and it's worth uh, noting it. You may show up on the exam somewhere. So the question really is, is it about cooling, is it about dehumidification, or is it about heating? And there's actually a very simple way to think about this. Uh, in a temperate zone, uh, temperate zone is, uh, what that's referring to is, it's the part of the country that gets both uh, seriously cold days and seriously hot days. Like if we were talking about something, say, in Anchorage, we'd probably mostly be just worried about how cold it gets. So we would be totally focused on the heating system. If we were talking about something in Phoenix, yeah, it gets a, you know, a little cool every once in a while, but we're really mostly worried about the, the cooling system. So the question is, in a temperate zone, how do you choose which one you're designing for? Uh, and the answer is on this, um, when we're talking about an HVAC system for the duct work, uh, we're gonna be designing for a cooling system. And the reason for that is because if you think about how uh, hot the air is coming out of a air handling unit in the heating season and compare that to the air of the room. Uh, you know, let's say we have air coming out at uh, 110 degrees and the heat of the room is say uh, 68. So we have a temperature difference of about 42 degrees. This is in the heating, heating system in the winter. In the cooling, let's say our room temperature is, uh, I don't know, say 75. Well, the air temperature that's gonna be blowing through is probably gonna be about 55. Now, it could be lower, it could be a little higher, it's a couple different things, but very quickly you realize, wow, even, you know, that's only a 20 degree difference. 
So in order to change the volume of air, the, the temperature of a volume of air, say this is a room, uh, if you imagine that room, somebody's standing in there, right? And we're gonna try to change that, the temperature of that room by say one degree. If I'm blowing in air that has a difference of 42 degrees from the current temperature, it's gonna go much faster than if I'm blowing in air that only has a delta difference of 20 degrees. So if it's gonna be much harder to do with, uh, for cooling than it is for the heating, that means the harder one is gonna rule. And I'm gonna to have to define uh, all my choices through cooling. So the size of the duct is actually gonna be sized uh, for a cooling system. And then you just kind of know that the heating system will work because it's, that cooling system is gonna be, the duct is gonna be bigger than what it would actually be needed for the heating system. So it's kind of a funny, you have to kind of think through it in a sort of odd way. Uh, if you're doing both heating and cooling and they're both important, well, how do you, how do you design the duct work? Uh, it comes down to the fact that the delta, the difference between the kind of lived in the room temperatures uh, and the supplying temperature is so much lower for cooling. I have so much smaller of a difference uh, that I have to really focus on that one to be able to get that one to work. Uh, this other one uh, I can do much more easily because I have a much bigger delta. I can just dump in some air and it'll pretty rapidly change the temperature of a room. So then one question is, well, why don't I just make, so why am I using 55 degree air and not say 35 degree air? Um, and the answer to that is, one, it's a little bit harder to make 35 degree air, it's a little expensive. But the real answer is, you start blowing 35 degree air into a room uh, where people are trying to work or, or sleep or something like that, and you'll get complaints immediately. Our bodies just don't like air blowing on us that's that cold. Uh, whereas warm air doesn't bother us in the winter, we don't mind having that get blown on us uh, with that big of a difference. Tina has a good question. She says, in the equation and what we're showing here, is it, are we showing it backwards? Shouldn't the larger difference be the higher volume? Shouldn't a 42 degree difference result in a higher volume? Uh, uh, no, um, I, this is why I say it's a little counterintuitive and it takes a little kind of getting used to. Um, the, if, you, if you think that, the, if you imagine that every cubic foot, so every CFM, cubic foot per minute uh, of air, so here's a little cubic foot of air uh, going about to go into this room. And that cubic foot of air is 42 degrees warmer than this room is. And I'm gonna have a whole bunch of these. I've got them all lined up all in a row. They're all these cubic feet of air ready to move along uh, through this process, going through that ductwork, right? And that thing's 42 degrees, that air in that cubic foot is 42 degrees warmer than the air in that room. Well, it's not gonna take too many of those cubic feet before I can raise this room temperature by a degree or to five degrees or 10 degrees, whatever it is I'm trying to do. Whereas if I have less d difference, so now imagine we're cooling, and instead of this being 42 degrees different, it's now only 20 degrees different, I have to put in a whole bunch more of these ones that are only 20 degrees different before the temperature inside that space is gonna get, uh, uh, changed. So uh, the, the temp change in the room is going to depend on uh, the, number, the, the sheer number of cubic feet per minute. Uh, and if the difference in temperature is uh, so close, then obviously I need more cubic feet. Um, if you think about it, like let's say for just a quick sec, imagine that instead of being 55, let's say it was, uh, uh, you know, 70 degrees. It was only a five, uh, degree difference. Well, clearly if I'm pumping in air that's only five degrees different, it's gonna take an awful lot of air uh, before it's gonna impact the, the room temperature. Uh, so uh, we're just kind of expanding that a little bit to sort of more usable, usable uh, numbers, something like 55, somewhere in that range. Uh, but because of that, because of you're bringing in the, that CFM, uh, that delta makes a big difference. And so, yeah, the cooling will be uh, the bigger amount. And along those same lines, if you use that, if you use that ex same example, if the heating were 400 degrees. Right, right. If we had a 400 degree difference 
in the in the delta between the the two temperatures you know you can put in a few cfm uh, and it would immediately change the temperature of that room right so if you exaggerate it this is actually a pretty good strategy on the exam uh, if you exaggerate the situations, usually they explain themselves pretty fast. Is there a, another question? Is there a, like a normal or a natural limit to how cold the system could make the air? You know, like is, can, can a system only make it so cold in a room? Um, th there are each of the different uh, refrigerants and you know different types of uh, chillers versus uh, you know some other systems. Each of them will have some sort of natural limit. I actually don't really know what it would be because almost nobody ever goes to it uh, in terms of regular architecture. Um, you'd find it obviously in systems that are you know for walk-in refrigerators and you know there's all kinds of places where the same basic idea is happening. Um, but that's you know it's not my world, so I don't really know. But the, uh, the gist of it is, yes, you can actually make those sort of pretty standard systems go down um, easily to like 30, in the 30s range. Um, and then some, I'm sure, can go down into the teens and, and you know, single digits. I don't think you could easily go below that until unless you had very, very specific uh, refrigerant uh, system. But like I said, it's all about human comfort and human comfort it's going to be hard to get those uh, temperatures below say 50 or something uh, before it really bugs people all right number five uh, so this is a little bit of a uh, trick one um, and it's meant to uh, for you to make sure you're reading it uh, in a typical tenant office construction so uh, it's an office building, bunch of tenants in the building, so it uses the word tenant, so there's lots of different people. Uh, the supply system is usually ducted plenum, always cooling, a VAV box. Um, the thought here is that ducted seems way too simple of an answer, um, that plenum is a little kind of, well, that sounds like a good word. Um, VAV box, that also sounds like kind of something interesting. The answer is actually A, ducted. Um, in a typical system, in a typical office, uh, I'm gonna have, uh, drop ceiling, I'm going to have uh, uh, people working in the office, uh, sitting at desks, uh, doing all what they're going to do, and I have this big space above uh, the uh, ceiling where I'm going to be bringing a ducted supply. It's going to go all over the building, and it's especially going to go over uh, near the perimeter windows. Let's say we've got windows over here. Uh, and it's going to blow air into that space, and it's going to that air is going to blow through, and kind of keep everybody nice and conditioned. Uh, and then let me make clear my ceiling here. Um, and then we're going to put uh, essentially holes into that ceiling. Um, those holes will probably look very similar to uh, the typical supply vent uh, register, but there's going to be a hole into that ceiling. And that uh, uh, whole space up here, the entire uh, interstitial space above the ceiling and below the uh, structural deck is going to be the plenum area. And that plenum area is going to be attached to a duct uh, that's going to be the return duct uh, and the supply ducts are going to be attached to those original ducts that we talked about. Um, and that return duct then essentially incorporates that entire interstitial space. So if I have the air handling unit pushing air out through the supply system, then it will automatically by, uh, create a vacuum behind it and it's gonna pull air from behind it. Well, where's it gonna pull from? It's gonna pull from the trunk lines of the return system. Where are they gonna pull from? They're gonna pull from the branch lines of the return system. Where are the branch lines gonna pull from? Well, they're gonna pull from these plenum spaces. So all of this space is essentially gonna be a way for the air to get a sort of vacuum, kind of pull that air up through, and it's gonna want all by itself to get up into that space uh, because of that sort of vacuum pull. And when all of that happens correctly, that means that this thing is sort of pumping air out into the space, into the locations that you need it and want it, typically over by the edges, uh, by the perimeter, uh, and then allowing uh, the return air to find its way up into the plenum, uh, and then from there into the 
return system, and then from there back into the air handling unit where it gets reconditioned and blown out as supply air. And as other things, you have some outside air that gets added in, some maybe humidification or dehumidification that happens along the way. But that, that's the gist of that system. This is, you know, of those sort of office tenant uh, kinds of scenarios, this is probably 80% of it is just like this. Uh, so uh, very, very common. If this thing had said uh, the return system here, uh, I would have said the answer was B, plenum, but because it's talking about the supply system, it would be ducted. Um, it's quite possible uh, that you could actually have it the other way. Uh, you could have a plenum supply system. Uh, doesn't happen as often in this kind of scenario for various reasons, but it could. So there's lots of different ways you could do it, but at least 80% of the time it's going to be something like this, and so that would be much more expected on the exam. One question here is, um, is the VAV box not the correct answer based on the fact that it's only a part of a ducted system? Yeah, the VAV box, um, the, the thing that you don't know is that uh, uh, the supply, like I said, the vast majority of the time it's going to be ducted, but you don't necessarily know that it's going to be a VAV box. Um, that could be um, a variable air volume box, a VAV box. It could be a CAV box, a constant air volume box. It could be uh, that it's some mix of those two. It could be, uh, there's a sort of whole range. The VAVs are just a pretty common one, but there's a number of other common ones as well. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, that's a, not a bad answer, but I don't think it's as good an answer as just being ducted um, because that's really in, in play with uh, the, the idea of the plenum. Um, but yeah, I, I hear the question, and I think it's a, that's a good question. Uh, it's just that there's a lot of other choices as well. Okay. Okay, so we're back to the chillers. Um, again, just kind of uh, thinking about these as basic systems and how you think about them. Typical chiller has a hot condenser barrel, a cold evaporator barrel, and something else. What's the other thing? Uh, so, all right, we talked about how um, as a barrel, for some reason they were on their sides. I, whenever you say barrel, I always think they should be standing upright, but in fact, they're on their sides usually. Uh, so it's this big box, and in this big box, uh, I've got kind of a coilish thing happening there, and then a coilish thing happening there. And that's the refrigerant loop. So this is a pipe filled with refrigerant. And we're going to have um, a uh, compressor right down here and an evaporator right up here. Um, they're probably not actually in that location. They're slightly different. Like the, the actual design of these things is a little odd, um, but you get the gist of it, I think, from this. Uh, and that uh, compressor is going to compress that material, that refrigerant material, and make this very hot. So it's the same refrigerant material in this pipe, but now it's very hot. Uh, and that's, we know that's going to be the case because there's a relationship between pressure and temperature. Uh, and then uh, at this evaporator, we're going to let the pressure off, and this refrigerant, same refrigerant is now very cool as it goes through this coil. So nothing has changed except for the pressure, and because of the pressure, it's changed the temperature, but it's the same refrigerant. We haven't let any in, let any out, and it just goes back and forth in this process. And so that compressor makes that refrigerant hot, the evaporator makes it cool, it makes it hot again, it makes it cool again, and it just keeps moving back and forth. So this cold barrel over here has cool water in it. So this is cool water. And that cool water, while being cool, is still warmer than the cold refrigerant after it's gone through the evaporator. So what's going to happen? Well, the warmer body is always going to be giving its heat to the cooler body. So even though it's cool water, it's still warmer than the refrigerant, and it's giving its heat to that refrigerant. That refrigerant then comes down over to here, gets to the uh, uh, condenser, 
that refrigerant becomes very hot because now it's been condensed and we, this is a relationship between the temperature and this pressure. Uh, and so now it's very hot refrigerant. It still has taken on the, the heat from that cool barrel. It's pulled as much of the heat as it can from that because it was colder than that cool barrel when it went through, but now it's much hotter. And we have the hot barrel on this side, hot-ish barrel, I should say, I guess. Um, and this hot water on this, in this barrel is not as hot as the hot refrigerant. So the hot body is always gonna be giving its heat to the cool body. In this case, the hot-ish water, let's say ish there, uh, the hot-ish water in that barrel is gonna be cooler than the hot refrigerant. And so the refrigerant is giving its heat into that hot barrel of water. So effectively, we are doing this very complicated process in order to take a little bit of heat out of the cool side and give it to the hot side. So in that process, uh, we are moving heat from one side to the other, and then we get rid of that heat through that heat rejection loop up in the cooling tower, uh, and then we bring what we need back into that element so we can get it very hot, it gets up, we get rid of it into the cooling tower, we bring it back to get hot again, gets up, gets rid of it in the cooling tower, uh, and then the chilled side, we have the chilled water loop going on and that goes out uh, into the various air handling units when it's been used in those coils, it then comes back. So it's losing that coolness, if you will, to the air. So we're giving the coolness that we've just created here to the air so that when it blows into the space, we get air conditioning. Uh, but then that, uh, the water in that pipe isn't as cool anymore. So it's coming back, it's still cool-ish, but it's not uh, as cold as it was, it's not as chilled as it was, so it's coming back, it's essentially bringing the heat of the room where the people are, where the air handling stuff is happening, so there's the people doing whatever they do, uh, and the air is blowing around them, and the heat from them is being given to the chilled water pipe in that coil, uh, and then that coil is bringing that heat back down to this barrel, and then it's giving that heat to the cool side of the refrigerant, which is then getting compressed, and giving that same heat off to the hot side of the refrigerant, which then sends that heat up to the cooling tower and eventually sends it outside. So, all right, we've got all that stuff going on. So if we have a uh, hot condenser boil, a barrel, excuse me, uh, and a uh, cool uh, evaporator barrel. What else do we have? We have the refrigerant loop. So I think the potential answers here are refrigerant, because uh, I think that's a reasonable uh, answer. Um, you could say a refrigerant loop, a refrigerant system. Uh, uh, any, anything revolving around refrigerant would have been a correct answer in this scenario. Um, so uh, one question came in, which is talking about uh, compressors versus condensers. Um, the, the process of um, a condenser is essentially a compressor uh, in a slightly remote scenario. So like if your, your house has a condenser unit, um, that's where the refrigerant literally goes outside so that it's doing its heat rejection uh, directly right there. Um, the compressor is the thing that's actually in the device uh, compressing the, the uh, refrigerant. Uh, so they're similar, they're all part of one, one kind of system, but they're, they're slightly different terminology. Uh, one of the interesting things about this is people often wonder why uh, air conditioning is so expensive. Uh, and you know, the assumption is always, well, we've got a lot of fans all over the place. Um, must be the fans. Actually, the fans are relatively cheap, relatively small amount of energy. The big, big issue is compressing all that uh, refrigerant into, uh, uh, into that system. That's where huge amounts of the dollars and energy goes. Shamilia is asking, uh, would compressor be a good answer to? Yeah, yeah, that would, that would also be a, a potentially good answer. Um, uh, I think anything that's likely to be actually in that system, so the expansion valves, um, uh, the, even the coils would be potentially a good answer. Um, one of the things I, I should quickly say here, um, just I don't want to get too, uh, too detailed on this, but the actual water in the barrel is probably not the water that gets sent 
uh, out through the chilled water loop. The chilled water loop would have its own coil kind of right next to it. So the barrel water is just a device to send the heat from one coil to the other. Uh, and the same thing would be true on this other side. So it's actually two sets of, of coils uh, in each barrel, uh, the refrigerant coil and the other one. All right, let's move on to seven. Client is worried about the noise from the HVAC system. Uh, which of the following would, be, would you possibly suggest? Uh, check for that apply. We have dampers, duct lining, chiller, absorption cooling tower, base isolators, radiant floor, cool beam. Uh, so this is a pretty simple, straightforward concept. Um, if you don't know some of the terms, it might be a little difficult. Um, the ones that jump out at me as uh, not being relevant uh, would be the cooling tower. And chiller, there are reasons why you could, you could claim chiller would help with noise. The fact that you put the chiller into the basement or something like that, you kind of remove it away. But it's just not the likely kind of answer in this scenario. Um, uh, so uh, the possible sort of most reasonable answers, um, a duct lining is going to be by far, by far uh, the biggest uh, possible answer. The second one would be base isolators. So a duct lining, let's talk about those two for a second. Um, duct lining uh, would be uh, essentially insulation that goes onto the inside of a duct. Um, you can also do insulation onto the outside of a duct, and that will have a certain kind of impact. It'll um, insulate, obviously, the air, but it also will reduce some of the sound that, that generates back and forth. Um, but the big thing that the duct lining on the inside is it's going to reduce the sound um, that's going to reverberate through the metal ducts. So the duct lining will make a big, big impact uh, on the sound that the air is making going through that as a system. Um, uh, the base isolators, anytime I have something with, say, fans or compressors or anything like that, I've got that fan blowing along, right? This whole thing is kind of shaking uh, as that fan kicks on and kicks off. Um, and if I have that sitting directly on a floor, then that shaking uh, is going to go right through that floor structure, and it's going to end up to us as sound. If I have it directly attached to a steel structure, say, up at the ceiling, uh, the same thing would be true. It's going gonna, it's gonna to send that vibration through that steel structure anywhere in the building, and it will come out as sound waves. Uh, so the idea of a base isolator is that instead of having that thing directly attached to something, I am sitting it on little spring devices so this thing can shake all at once. Uh, but it's not going to reverberate through the floor, at least not too much. Um, the other way to do that is uh, often you'll see like you know big ductwork elements that are attached to air handling units. So the the fans are shaking the ductwork, and so these things are hung uh, with wires, uh, and so the wires make it very difficult for the uh, duct to send that uh, that vibration up to the structure. But even with that, they will sometimes put in little springs. Uh, on there so that uh, even more so it can't send that uh, vibration through. So base isolators are, are uh, kind of very important for this as a process. Uh, then a radiant floor is going to be very, very quiet. A cool beam is also a radiant system. That's going to be a very quiet way of doing heating. Um, it's not a particularly likely possible answer uh, in uh, everyday life um, uh, and in terms of um, uh, you know, cool beams are fairly specific. Uh, they, they only really get used in reasonably high-end uh, elements. But if, the, if somebody was very concerned, they're very worried about uh, the noise, well, a radiant system would certainly make uh, a big difference. Uh, it's going to be much, much quieter as a system. Uh, and then the fourth one would be uh, dampers. I actually think dampers is kind of a, the least uh, possible answer. Um, but the dampers would allow you to uh, if there's a noise problem, to be able to slow down the air and uh, cr create zones that didn't get as much air. Uh, so you would be able to uh, hold on to those, uh, separate out the places that got a lot of air and the places that only got a little bit of air, and, and those would be quiet. Looks like we, um, in this PDF here, there was a, uh, uh, an additional option, which was option G. 
and that option was remote location rooftop unit. Yeah, that's a much better answer. I thought there was a better answer. <laughs> um, there's a remote location, that's a much better answer. Uh, I, I put it up on the uh, rooftop. Dampers um, is a reasonable answer, but uh, remote location would be a better answer. So, and often you'll find there are, there are uh, say, I, I would put dampers kind of similar to chiller. Um, they're good possible answers, um, but they're not the best answers, right? And that's one of the things the exam does all the time. All right, cool, thanks for catching that, whoever caught that. Number eight, number eight is just a vocabulary one. And I gotta tell you, I hate this one uh, because to me, it's just 100% backwards. Uh, so, number eight, a blank stack vent is used for a toilet. So there's a, a descriptor word that goes with it. Um, you would think that uh, if the two words are um, waste, the two potential ones, uh, and soil, you would think it would be a waste, that a toilet has human waste in it, and so that would be a waste stack vent. Um, in fact, anytime there's human waste in it, it's a soil stack vent. Uh, and some version of this question will show up uh, on the exam in some way. Uh, I, I find it just backwards. It seems crazy to me that, that it, like why you would call soil when there's human waste involved. It just seems weird. Um, but that's what the answer is, so there you go. Number nine, if the air gap is in question, then it is likely that you will be required to install, then the question is what? A regulator, a check valve, a filter, a thermal break. So this is one of those terms that you would need to recognize to really know what we're talking about here, the air gap. And an air gap is something that essentially nobody cares about except uh, the municipal water uh, department. And they are, very, uh, they think it's like the most important thing. And it is in this big scale thing. Because the air gap is the way that we protect our water systems, our municipal water systems, from whatever uh, contamination uh, somebody might have in their sink. Um, so remember that sink we were looking at earlier? We've got our drain down here, it's got the trap and it goes down, has the vent line going up. I've got uh, my faucet coming over here. Um, and I fill that uh, sink up with water, and that right there is my air gap. That's the spot where the contamination from whatever you have in your sink, because who knows what's in that sink, maybe it's a laboratory sink, maybe it's uh, um, uh, you know, some bacteria on some old food or something, um, whatever that contamination is, it's not gonna be able to leap up and into that faucet and therefore contaminate the water that's in there, which could conceivably contaminate all the way back uh, to the water main in the street. So the air gap is the idea that you don't wanna let the, the supply portion get near any of this. Con once it's considered wastewater, once it's out you know, out of the system, it's considered, considered contaminated because uh, who knows what's in it. Uh, so the air gap is keeping those things separate. So then, okay, what about, let's say I have this as a kitchen sink and you probably, many of you probably have one of those little hand sprayers. It's on like a flexible little device that uh, you can spray off. It's got a little thing. Well, what if you drop that right in the sink? Like, wouldn't that be making it so there's no air gap? And the answer is yes, that would be making it so there's no air gap. And the only way that you would be able to do that is as part of this device, I would have to have a check valve. So a check valve is somewhere in that pipe. It's gonna be a little device. Uh, and that device is gonna be set up, a little swinging door, if you will. And when the water is going this way, that water goes right on through but if for some reason there's suction and it starts pulling the water the other direction, and that actually happens fairly regularly. Imagine that uh, 
uh, a fire truck pulls up next door to your, your building and there's a house on fire down the block and they're pumping all this water out of the fire hydrant, well suddenly that whole neighborhood, the pressure completely changes in the whole neighborhood because they're pulling this huge amount of water out all at once. Uh, so you can very easily suddenly get a negative pressure inside a, a building that's near that. And there's other reasons why it might happen as well. Um, so suddenly I have this water going the other direction. Well, instead of that door just naturally pushing open, it actually is going to push that door closed and it's going to, just by the flow of the water, going to be a way to stop the, what's now contaminated water over here from getting into the main system over there. Uh, regulators, filters, thermal brakes, those are all good things to think about, but they don't have anything to do with air gap. How about the backflow prevention device? Yeah, there's a number of different backflow preventers. Um, the, uh, the other ones would be a little, like there's RPZs, uh, a reduced um, pressure zone. Uh, there's um, vacuum breakers. There's a whole series of other uh, sort of valve types that uh, would, would do this same thing. Um, none of those happen to be listed, so the check valve is just the simple, easiest one to answer. But yeah, any of those would be used. Those tend to be used um, like a RPZ, which is very expensive and kind of big and clunky. They're kind of crazy looking. They're really worth looking up because they're sort of wacky looking. Um, they use uh, this uh, kind of z uh, vacuum zone so that the, the water would have to leap across this vacuum uh, and instead uh, it allows air to get in uh, to replace it so it just doesn't suck the water through. Um, and those are often used in like irrigation systems. Um, so that's the RPZs. Um, uh, so like, because uh, that could, the water officials just hate irrigation systems because they're very, very nervous that there's going to be like, who knows what kind of contaminants are out there uh, and how it's, you know, like a hose sitting in a puddle, uh, you know, all of that is a, is a huge potential problem. So RPZs would be for big scenarios. Um, the vacuum breakers would be for like a household hose because it's, you don't have as much worry. It's not used as much. Um, so be a different situation, but absolutely. Yeah, that's a really good question. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, number 10. Um, this is sort of a, a kind of oddball, but it, it's here to sort of represent a series of uh, potential questions you might get. A trom wall, um, you'll hear pe people will say it a couple different ways, but I believe it's supposed to be a trom wall. Um, is an example of is it a high R value assembly? Is it a passive heating system? Is it a system of gathering electrical energy from an occupant's activities? Is it a natural air filter? Uh, and the answer is a trom wall is a passive heating system. Uh, so trom walls, just to kind of put an image to it, uh, if you imagine you have a room, you have people in the room, and uh, Right here, I have a big, thick element uh, that is a material that is a very good heat sink. So it's a heat sink like, let's say, concrete or something like that. So it can absorb a really massive amount of heat. Uh, and then right here, I have a window right in front of that great big heat sink. And I have this air gap in between. So there's a little space in between. It might be four inches, it might be six inches, it might be 12 inches. Some, some certain situations it gets bigger than that. Um, and what happens is I get that uh, solar radiation through the glass. It warms up that concrete. So the concrete gets nice and toasty warm, but because it's such a big heat sink, it takes a very long time, and eventually, after many hours, that heat penetrates through that big heat sink and starts radiating out into the space. So the idea here is I can use this great big heat sink as a way when I have sun when I, when I don't want it during the day, because things are already hot during the day because of the sun, but then at night when it gets nice and cool, uh, I want to. Now I need to actually heat the space. Well, I can do it through uh, because this 
uh, heat sink, this big wall, this trom wall, has absorbed heat through the entire day, and now it's many hours later, it's nighttime, it's gonna give off that heat into the space during the evening. And then after the evening is over, it's been giving off heat all, all night, uh, eventually it's sort of given off all of its heat and what happens? Well, the sun rises the next day and it gets warmed up again. So it's this sort of simple system of uh, delaying the solar gain until when you want it. You have this huge amount of solar gain during the day and you delay it uh, till when you need it at night using this big, uh, big heat sink of a, of a wall, of a trom wall. Uh, so a couple of quick things to say about that. For one is it's not going to work everywhere. It really is a sort of perfect thing in certain kinds of climates where you uh, have a you know, reasonably hot sun during the day and reasonably cold uh, nighttime. So uh, kind of southwest or something would be a great example. Um, but it works in other places. The other thing you can start to do, you can start messing with it a little bit. Uh, so you could have a uh, vent opening down at the bottom and a vent opening up at the top and then maybe a vent opening in the window at the top and a vent opening in the window at the bottom. And so with uh, some careful consideration, you could imagine, let's say you really want to get some heat during the day because it's very cold out. Well, cold air that's down uh, at the floor level is going to find its way into that space. The sun will warm it up. It's going to warm up and then eventually come out the top because warm air will rise. And then it's going to move through the space eventually getting cool because it's moving through the space and when it gets cool it then goes uh, once again back in the system so you can get a convective current going just by the sheer fact that there's a warm sun in this space and if you don't want it you just close the vents and the air stops moving and there you go well what if it's what if it's during the summer and we have too much air and we too much heat coming in we don't want it well i can open uh, this these two guys uh, i can let air in from outside and it's going to come in, it's going to warm up, which is already hot, but it's going to warm up even more, therefore it's going to rise and it's going to want to get out, so now it rises up and out and I'm effectively cooling down my heat sink by constantly bringing in fresh air uh, to, to pick up some of that heat and then move it on out. Uh, I can then take fresh air from outside, warm it up, and bring it inside. I could take uh, cool air from the floor, let it warm up, and create a sort of constant flow of new air, especially if I bring in uh, some outside air from the other side. Um, so this one weird little system, because of the nature of heat rising, and the sun is always going to heat that uh, air and that wall up, it can heat and, and provide convective currents which feel like cooling and a whole series of different things. It's an amazingly useful uh, system uh, that can do all kinds of different stuff. Uh, so why do you never see it? Well, the main answer to that is it's really odd to have somebody standing out here looking at a building there's a big sheet of glass, and six inches back, there's a whole bunch of concrete, right? It just sort of is an odd thing to do, and so you don't see it all that often. Um, this is very similar, though, to the idea of having like a big sheet of glass and then a heat sink in the floor. So I have sun coming in and warming that concrete floor, and then that radiates through the space at night. It's just the trom wall is a little, has a little bit more kind of controlling capacity. You can, you can mess with it more, and it can do more for you. Um, let's see here. Uh, Jimmy asked, would that be good in hot, arid locations? Yes, absolutely. Hot, arid locations it's perfect for because hot, arid locations tend to have uh, a lot of excess warmth in the day, but it actually gets pretty darn cool at night. And so that's the perfect spot for it. But you can actually use similar ideas in a wider variety, even temperate zones and things like that, because once you start adding the vents, you, it, it can the convective currents that get created can do lots and lots of different possible things. Um, but the, it, like if you were guessing, uh, you would say it was probably a hot arid zone. Okay. Um, and I think you talked about this, but uh, in addition to radiation, uh, convection occurs too. You talked about that. Yeah, right? because the, the air gets warmed up and it rises. Uh, and so because you know that's going to happen, you can give it more air to warm up and let it come in, or you can use that as a way to generate sort of pulling in cool air from the 
far side because you know it's going to rise and get out and that's going to create a suction behind it, a vacuum behind it, and it's going to pull air from wherever you give it the opportunity to pull from. Uh, and so it can do all kinds of things. It's just that it's awkward looking and a little uh, expensive because of the big double wall system. Okay, there were a couple questions about number seven here. I just want to make sure we had them all. So these four are the answers that we want, right? Yeah, yeah so um, uh, I would actually, I think uh, A is sort of the one that's on the borderline. So I would actually get rid of A and go with uh, B, E, F, and G. Um, and then A and C are sort of very close because there are reasons you could answer that, but the other four are the better answers. An absorption cooling tower just really doesn't have anything to do with anything. It's just a different kind of cooling tower. It doesn't really impact uh, sound at all. Okay, Jason asked one question. How do we calculate the air changes per hour? I think this was going back to this one here. I'm not sure if that's... Uh, um, well, Jason, you're going to have to hold on for a different, <laughs> uh, different lecture. That's a, that's a relatively complicated uh, process. Um, uh, there are some rules of thumb about these things, but um, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's, I think, a little too long for this, this yeah. uh, moment. So we'll have to hold that one for a later, a later webinar. All right. Well, um, so I think we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and end it right there. So thank you, Mike. Uh, thanks to all of you who've tuned in and who, to, uh, who submitted your questions. Uh, today. Uh, if you'd like to attend our next ARE live broadcast, uh, where you're, as I mentioned, you'll be able to ask Mike any questions about the ARE. You can visit blackspectacles.com slash podcast to register to attend. Uh, just like today's episode, you'll have a chance to ask questions and share your answers with Mike for live feedback during the broadcast. Uh, and to learn more about our AIA ARE prep curriculum, go to blackspectacles.com where you can try out any of the free course videos. Um, every one of our courses um, has videos you can check out uh, right there, so take a look. Um, and for those of you who are ready to start preparing for the ARE, uh, and if you're already an AIA member, um, as a part of our partnership with the AIA, you can visit um, the URL that you see right here, um, blacks, uh, bksp.es slash systems dash code, um, and you, there you can get a 15% discount uh, for the entire duration of your AIA ARE prep membership. And uh, so this is kind of fun. Uh, so the winner from today's uh, group of mock exam test takers, let's see here. So we had, um, we had 15 people submit their, uh, their mock exam answers um, before noon today. And I've numbered them one through 15. Um, and let's see here, Mike, maybe we'll pull up, I'm gonna pull up this uh, just to be <laughs> as, clear as I can be here. Let's see, I'm at uh, um, this website here, and we're going to make a 15 hour um, our number. So I'm going to generate a random number here. And uh, so just so you know, as I mentioned, I gave everyone a number, 1 through 15, and I'll list them off. So number one is Katina, number two is Adriana, and then going down, Daniel, Jason, M. Joseph J, Laura C is six, Michael W is seven, Munir, Rodrigo, Stephen P, Joanna, Philip, Devang, Carlos, and Shamilia um, is number 15. And so that's one through 15 in order. So to get our winner, we'll generate the number, and it is number eight. Let's number see. eight is Munir T. So Munir, uh, you are the winner of our... Um, Let's see, you win a, you've won a free one month membership uh, for Black Spectacles AIA ARE, ARE prep tutorials and our software tutorials. It's our unlimited membership. Um, so congratulations. Awesome. Um, we'll send you a note um, tomorrow uh, so you can redeem that. Um, and for everyone else, make sure you submit your answers for our next mock exam so you can be entered into our monthly drawing. Finally, please leave a comment below the video to let us know what you think and share any suggestions you may have. Just like every time, I promise we'll read every word that you write and use them to tune our next episodes. So thanks for watching. <laughs>